Welcome to Kids in the Kitchen, a curriculum that encourages young people to eat healthier meals and snacks through hands-on cooking experiences. Kids in the Kitchen students will prepare simple, healthy foods that they can make for themselves and their families at home. They will also learn important food safety practices and the value of good nutrition. The University of Missouri Extension Family Nutrition Education Program has been gathering data on kids in the kitchen since 2008. This data has revealed an improvement in healthy behaviors among the program participants. The evaluation tool used for kids in the kitchen has been changed to the Teacher Observation and Behavior Report, which better tracks change over time and involves the teacher in classroom follow-up. The feedback from this evaluation allows educators to record any changes in student behavior they may observe. Kids in the Kitchen has three levels. Level A is for six to nine-year-olds, while level B is for children ages 10 to 12, and level C is for ages 13 to 15. The lessons taught are appropriate for the development domains of the students, and these domains are physical, cognitive, and social-emotional development. Don't be puzzled over the components of each lesson, as each lesson includes an easy-to-follow lesson outline, clear, concise objectives, core activities that directly reinforce the objectives. These core activities should be used each time the lesson is taught. Advanced preparation directions for recipes that require additional prep time, a general equipment and supply list is included for each lesson and activity. Student handouts coinciding with each activity can be found in the handouts and visual aid section of the curriculum. Each lesson also contains safety tips related to the topic. And finally, there is a review of the concepts from each lesson taught. Curricula is always evolving and changing Therefore, additional recipe sheets for Level A were created to reflect common core state standards. As you may already know, the once familiar My Pyramid Dietary Guideline graphic has been changed to the My Plate graphic. My Plate is the current dietary guideline logo for the United States Department of Agriculture. However, this too is subject to change. Therefore, when you see the following phrase, current USDA food graphic, written in the course material, replace that phrase with the name of the current dietary guideline logo. Before teaching kids in the kitchen lessons, read the recipes and become familiar with the procedures. A few things to note about the recipes. The term fat-free is used in this curriculum. However, on some food packaging, you may see similar phrases such as non-fat, these terms are usually interchangeable. Choose ingredients with lower levels of fat and sodium whenever possible. Adjust recipe ingredients to accommodate food allergies and other health concerns and religious beliefs. A food allergy is an abnormal response to a food that is triggered by the body's immune system. Approximately six million children in the United States have one or more food allergies, and among these, 16 to 18 percent have experienced an allergic reaction to food at school. To avoid this, the food restrictions form is used with this curriculum. Parents or caregivers must complete this form for each child and return to the NPA for their files. Physical activity is an important component of kids in the kitchen and is incorporated throughout all levels of the curriculum. Each lesson includes a physical activity that matches the theme of the lesson. These activities are explained on the physical activity posters. Each lesson contains a one-page modified lesson titled, Kick It Up. Kick It Up lessons describe an alternate way to teach the lesson with more emphasis on physical activity and less on food preparation. Kick It Up offers simple snack recipes, which contain five ingredients or less, require no cooking, and can even be prepared outdoors. Kick It Up also includes a nutrition concept that matches the theme of the regular lesson. Time permitting, you can choose to add more nutrition information to the regular lesson. 
You will need a set of physical activity cards to help you choose physical activities for students to warm up, engage in aerobic and cool down activities. Information on how physical activity cards are purchased is on page two under materials needed to teach the curriculum. The printed overview for kids in the kitchen includes a suggested equipment list. These small portable items can be packed in a plastic tub or other container for easy transport. Information for ordering additional resources such as posters, games, and incentives are located in the written overview of the curriculum. It's a good idea to provide students with a folder to store the recipes and handouts that are given to them. This is a fun and practical way for students to use the materials to create their own Kids in the Kitchen recipe book. At the end of the program, each student will receive a Kids in the Kitchen Certificate of Completion to recognize their participation and accomplishment. This completes the overview of the curriculum. Before teaching Kids in the Kitchen, please read the curriculum thoroughly and view the training videos for the level you plan to teach. Good luck and have fun with Kids in the Kitchen. Hello and welcome to the first lesson of Kids in the Kitchen Level A Kitchen Sense. The objectives for this lesson are for students to be able to determine and follow safety rules for working in the kitchen, recognize unsafe food preparation techniques, wash hands properly, and prepare a healthy recipe. So if you're ready, let's get started. Hello. Today we are going to be learning about some kitchen rules in a lesson called Kitchen Sense. These rules are really important for children ages six through nine before they begin working in the kitchen because a lot of kids have never read a recipe or put ingredients together to make something at home for their family and for their friends. So that's what we're going to be learning about. So in your kit, you have the Think Safety uh, instructions for rules and it's really a good idea to put these onto a permanent poster so that you can have these ready refer to them every time you do a lesson and that way they're already there so on the other side of your sheet you have the additional rules and we will be using these rules each time we're in the kitchen then we have a activity that the students really love and it's called the contaminated sandwich. So what you do is you ask the students if they've ever had a peanut butter and syrup sandwich. And a lot of times the students will look at me and go, what? I say, yeah, peanut butter and syrup sandwich and I'm going to make you one right now. So I take a small bowl and I add two tablespoons of peanut butter one teaspoon of syrup in the bowl, stir it, and when I stir it, I take the knife and I lick it. And notice also, I didn't wash my hands before I started this activity. Then I have some bread. I take the bread and I take the peanut butter and syrup and spread it over the bread. And then I cough into my hands and then I take the, sandwich, the other piece of bread and smack the two together. And then I feel a <coughs> cough or a sneeze come on. And then um, I put the sandwich down on a plate and then I kind of run my hands through my hair. And then I take the sandwich and I say, would you like a bite of this? And the kids will go, yuck, no. So what you do then is you go over all the things that you did wrong and this really gets the ch children's attention and it reinforces the rules that we've already gone on. The next activity is sticky germs and in this activity what I did is I have a bottle of vegetable oil and I've added a couple of teaspoons of cinnamon, ground cinnamon, and I shake it up. I choose three people and I have the students rub the oil all over their hands and then I have one student go in front of the class but one student will go and wash their hands with just cold water and then smell them and then I'll say 
Now, did you get the oil off your hands? And they'll go, no. And then, can you still smell that cinnamon? Yes, so are your hands clean? Do you think there might be still some germs there? And they'll say, hmm, no, they're, they're not clean. So the next person will go and wash with just warm water, and I go through the same scenario with them, asking them the questions. And then by the, the next time, the next person will go wash their hands with warm soap and water. And then I'll say, now, did your hands get clean this time? And they'll say yes. So this is to demonstrate that students need both warm water and soap to clean their hands properly. And this is really a good activity, and the kids really enjoy it. Another activity is using the Glow Germ Lotion. And beforehand, you would actually put a little bit of the lotion onto the apple and rub it in. And then you would tell kids that this apple represents fresh fruit. And think about, you know, when you go to the grocery store, how many people have handled that and transferred germs to the apple. The lotion is like the germs that you spread on it. You don't tell them that, but you do tell them that, you know, you've spread something on there. Then you take your black light and you shine it onto the apple and everywhere you have rubbed with the apple with the lotion, you see the glow germ on there. Now this isn't real germs, but this is what happens with real germs. Germs are transferred from our hands to other objects. So the only way that you can get rid of the germs on the apple is to what, kids? And the kids would tell me, we need to wash the apple. And we just use regular water. Then I would move into a physical activity. And we would use the germ buster exercise. And this exercise goes along with the theme of germs. Next, we would do the trail mix recipe. And in this recipe, uh, what I do is I pass the recipe out to the students. We would read over the ingredients. Then we would read the instructions, the directions, so that we have that right. We would make sure that we have all the ingredients out. And in this particular lesson, what I do, since I'm working with um, the younger kids, I will have everything ready for them, and I'll have the kids help me wash the tables off, uh, which goes back to our first, one of our um, rules in the kitchens to make sure that everything is clean. With the ingredients, I would have the ingredients pre-mixed and out on the table, and the students would take their baggies, open the baggies, and they would take two tablespoons from each of the bowls that are on the table and put them into their baggie, seal them up, and then shake it. And that would be how they would mix it. So that would be their first recipe completed. There's also another recipe that you could choose, and it's called the Food Groove Funny Face. And in this recipe, you would need a graham cracker, a tablespoon of peanut butter, three to four raisins, a tablespoon of shredded low-fat cheddar cheese, two large green peas, and one grape. And you would set these ingredients out in bowls. You would use for the equipment measuring spoons, knives, plates. And the first thing, of course, students would wash their hands, spread the peanut butter on their graham cracker, and then they would complete a face with the rest of the ingredients. And during this recipe, you want to stress to the students not to lick or taste before, the, in, in before their recipe is completed. Included in your curriculum, you have Lesson 1, Level A with Kick It Up. Kick It Up is written as an alternative lesson, and you would use this, you know, according to how much space you have or how much space you don't have. A lot of times it would be a summer group. It could be an after-school program, and you would use this with mostly physical activity. You would choose three different activities, or more, just depending on how long you have. You would choose your activity cards. Then you would have your snack that you'd be preparing, or your food tasting. This recipe is peanut butter Play-Doh, and the kids really like this one. I hope this gives you some good ideas to do with your kids 
have fun, relax, and enjoy your students. Thank you. Welcome to Lesson 2A, The Incredible Edible Five Food Groups. In this lesson, the objectives are for students to identify foods from each of the five food groups and prepare a healthy snack using ingredients from these food groups. So let's begin. Hello, today we're building a healthy plate using my plate. This plate, I show the students, this is what your plate should look like. Each color is a food group and I will go over each of the food groups. You will do this with your students. I tell them that in order to be healthy, they need to make sure that they have at least five of the different food groups for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Although sometimes at breakfast it's hard to get five. So then you could add that in as a snack, whatever group you might have missed. Maybe you missed vegetables. Well, you could have a vegetable snack So later on in the day. So um, I also would play a game with them using these vegetable cards or the different car uh, food group cards. And I would put them in a bag and they would draw out different foods at one at a time. And then they would tell me what food group those belong in. Then we would move on to the incredible edible four food group parfait. And in this recipe, they would be learning how to level off using a teaspoon and a knife. That would be your kitchen tip. When they use the, they would dip it into their yogurt. They would have a teaspoon and maybe it's heaping, it's over the top. So in order to make it level, you would show the students to take the back side of their knife, run it across the top of the, uh, the spoon, and that is called leveling off. We would also wash our hands and the work area, which goes along with our kitchen sense rules. So those are things that we would do. The next thing we would do is we would have our physical activity. The physical activity would be the pump. And we have an additional exercise called the cereal shrug. Then we want to kick it up a little and we would use the kick it up activity. The kick it up activity extends your lessons or say you didn't have the space at school. You might want to do this in the summertime in a summer group. And mostly what it is is uh, physical activity, you would be choosing those from your physical activity cards. You would want to make sure that you would include a um, warm-up recipe, a warm-up activity, a aerobic activity, and a cool-down activity. The ones that I've chosen today would be the pantomime, and they would just pantomime different physical activities. And I've actually used my activity pyramid and had the children look at the um, activity pyramid and then whisper in my ear which, which one they wanted pantomime. And the students really love that one. The next one is called Fitness March. And they would, take, they would march around the room. And first they would start out uh, medium fast. Then you would go faster and faster, but you wouldn't run. Okay, so then you would follow that up with a cool down. The next one is called the spaghetti stretch and you would use your jump rope, a jump rope, to make different stretches using your jump rope. And the recipe would be the rainbow pita pockets recipe. You would be asking the students about the food, the four food groups and you would ask them which ones might be missing from this, uh, this, from this uh, recipe. And also you would close in asking them to name a food from each of the food groups. That's all for the five food groups. And don't forget to kick it up. Welcome back. This is lesson 3A, Rice is Nice. The objectives for this lesson are for students to be able to identify foods from the grain group, measure ingredients correctly, prepare a healthy recipe using whole grains, and use safe cooking techniques with the microwave, toaster, and conventional oven. Let's get started. In this lesson, we are going to be doing how many grain foods do we eat? 
In this activity, we will talk about different grains. And a lot of times, children this age don't know what grains are. So you want to explain to them what grains are. And one of the grains that we are going to be talking about today is rice. Rice and all grains are in the orange food group on my plate. Rice is grown right here in Missouri, so a lot of students might not know that, and it's one of the top producers of rice. We will also show them different kinds of grains, like wheat, and wheat is ground into flour. Oats is another type of grain food. And then we'll show them some cards, different kinds of cards that have some different kinds of grain foods, such as whole wheat bread, white flour bread, whole wheat waffles, couscous, and the kids will probably say, what's couscous? And you can say that couscous is a pasta, small pasta that comes from Northwest Africa. And I also like to, in this lesson, tell them that some gr grain foods like whole wheat, anything made from whole wheat is a superfood. And then we have some grain foods made from grains that really are sometimes foods. And they're really not in the food group, but because they're made with flour, kids always confuse that. So kids need at least six servings of grains every day for energy and three of those need to be from whole grains. So let's hopefully eat at least six kinds of grain foods every day. In this, in the next activity is called Measure It Right. And in this activity, we will be using different kinds of tools. And usually in this lesson, what I do is I set it up on three different tables. And each table will serve as a station to measure different kinds of items. With the measuring spoons, I will have them measure out salt, and I will use, have them use the teaspoon, and then I will show them how to level it off by using the back side of the knife, of a plastic knife. Then they would practice at another station using the measuring cups, one cup for flour, and again, we would show them how to measure flour or dry ingredients such as brown sugar or white sugar. And they would use the back side of their knife again after they've measured into the cup. And they would measure off one cup. And because they're younger, I would also have out just a half a cup. And they would do the same thing. So they would practice in this group learning how to measure dry ingredients. So this is a really fun activity. Also, to measure liquids, and I asked them, what kind of foods would we use that's liquid and we'd need to measure properly? And they will tell me milk, juice, different things like that. And I also tell them, well, sometimes oil and water. And so when uh, we measure out water, we always pour it in and we take the cup and it's usually on a surface, a level surface, and then we would get down low, eye level, and make sure that we come up to maybe if it's a half a cup, where it says a half a cup. And I would also show them on the, the cup itself, have them practice finding the different cup levels, okay? And they really like doing this. And if they get a little bit over, they could pour it back into a bowl. But I'd have a bowl a container like a pitcher with water and the liquid measuring cup. And if they go a little over, like I said, they can use the bowl to put that excess back into. Our physical activity for this section or this lesson is the leg rice activity. And they enjoy doing it. It's like a stretch, which goes along with our lesson. We're going to be going over some toaster oven tips. There is also in your handouts oven safety tips and microwave safety tips. And depending upon your site, you will choose whichever handout would be best suited for your site. But today we're gonna to be going over the toaster oven safety. And with our oven, we have a thermostat, we have a timer, we also have one shelf, and we have our 
pan that goes slides into the oven and when we shut it, it go, the whole rack goes in as well. We will be using pot holders because when we do this demonstration, we want to make sure students know how to use pot holders. We're working with hot ovens and so they need to use their pot holders to take their food in and out of the oven. Also tell the students that they need to preheat their oven. This recipe, pizza cake, we want to preheat the oven to 350 and they will prepare the recipe using rice cakes, tomato sauce and cheese. They will put them on the pan, slide it in the oven and then time it for 10 to 15 minutes. The next recipe that we have is called French Toast Sticks. And this recipe, you will be using an electric skillet. So you want to go over a little bit of safety with the students. You will want to make sure the students know how that the uh, skillet is plugged in. You will tell them that the element or the tip of this is very hot. And so you will, it will be very hot. So you want to make sure this is the part that heats the skillet. So you will plug it in like so, plug it into the outlet and then turn it on to preheat. And you will tell the students not to touch the pan anywhere except for the tip or the top of the lid because this is very hot and they could get burned. So then we would do the French toast sticks. The tip on the recipe today is use hot pads to take the pan from the oven which we've already demonstrated with this toaster oven. That's all for Rice is Nice. Don't forget to kick it up. Welcome back. The objectives for Lesson 4A, I'll Eat These Veggies, are for students to be able to identify foods from the vegetable group, identify different parts of plants that are eaten as vegetables, Learn the proper way to safely handle knives and pizza cutters. And prepare a healthy recipe using vegetables. So let's begin. All right, in this lesson, we refer to my plate and tell students that we are going to be eating our vegetables. And our vegetables are in this green area of our plate. And we also tell students that we really need our vegetables so that we can grow and stay healthy. Our core activity for this um, lesson is called Go Eat a Plant. This is a reference sheet and it shows the parts of a plant. And I always tell the students, did you know that you eat roots and leaves and stems? And the kids usually can't believe that. But as you go over this handout, they will see that, for example, when they eat carrots or they eat parsnips, they are actually eating the root parts. And then to reinforce this and to see where the, if they're understanding the material, I will have different pictures of different parts or different vegetables such as celery, green pepper, and I will use different pictures for each part of the plant. I will pass these pictures out to the students and the students will name the part of the vegetable and what the vegetable is. In our handouts, we also have a teacher reference for knives. And so in this knife handout, I will go over the different types of knives. Now in ele early elementary classes, I do not use regular knives. I use plastic knives instead. But I still go over this handout. So I will explain to them the different types of knives. We have a chef knife which they use that for chopping, slicing, dicing, and mincing. We have a utility knife, which I don't have shown here, but it is six to eight inches. It's used for smaller cutting jobs. We also have a serrated knife, which is not here. We use that for slicing bread. And a paring knife, which is a small knife there. And we use that for fruits and vegetables, for peeling, for removing stems, from strawberries, and you can also use those for making 
decorations, vegetable decorations. I also go over the fact that even though they're using plastic knives, they still need to have the knife on the cutting board when they're not using it. Never to put the knife in their mouth because even a plastic knife is sharp. Also, we will uh, use, always use a cutting board or in this grade level, I usually use a plate because they are using a plastic knife. Our physical activity today is celery slide. Our recipe for this lesson is ants on a log. You do not have to have a kitchen for this recipe. Your equipment is very simple. You need a table knife, a cutting board, and measuring spoons. And I always have them measure out their peanut butter or cream cheese onto a plate. I add, have them add the, or measure out the raisins, and then they put their uh, celery uh, ants on the log together. With this recipe, I go ahead and I have the celery already washed and ready in stalks, and all they have to do is cut them so that they get practice on cutting using their plastic knives. An alternate lesson or recipe is the food group butterfly. And this is another fun activity that you can choose. And it can extend your lessons, like if you do the vegetable lesson at another point in time, you could use this recipe. That's it for I'll Eat Those Vegetables. And don't forget to kick it up. Hello again. The objectives for Lesson 5A, did you ever see a kiwi? Are for students to be able to identify foods from the fruit group, prepare a healthy recipe using fruit, and handle knives and peelers safely. Let's get started. In today's lesson, we'll be looking at our plate again, and we'll be showing students that the red group is the fruit group, and you will be telling them that fruits ex excellent for them to eat. They need lots of fruit because fruits help them to grow healthy. It helps them also to heal their bodies. So they need fruit every day. You will also tell them that fruit is grown on plants, that on different types of plants such as trees, bushes, and vines. And then we will be talking about how to cut a fresh pineapple. And that is on our teacher reference. So you, if you are using fresh pineapple in this recipe, sometimes pineapple is a little pricey. So you might not use this, but you have it there if you will, want to use it. Then the next handout, which is grow your own pineapple, will help you because you will be telling the students that as they cut the pineapple, they'll cut the top half off, and this is the portion that they would be growing if they got to take home the top part of this pineapple. And this is what they would plant. Our physical activity for this lesson is the pineapple stretch. Our recipe that we're using today is called Yo Fruit. And you will be using fresh bananas, fresh kiwi, which is a fuzzy fruit, and your pineapple. Now, if you have used the pineapple in your demonstration of how to cut a pineapple, you would go ahead and use the fruit from that. If not, and it's too expensive for your budget, then you would be using canned pineapple. But remember, before they open the can, be sure and have them wash off the top of the can. They will also be um, you will also be demonstrating how to sprinkle nutmeg on, on this particular recipe. So you'll want students to maybe practice a little bit with a shaker and have them practice over a piece of wax paper or something just so that they know what sprinkle, the term sprinkle means. So they would be sprinkling lightly, not a lot, just a little. Also, you want to bring up the fact that if they're going to be cutting and using real knives instead of plastic knives that they have an adult present in the kitchen. An alternate recipe for this lesson is banana wraps. 
and they can also use this one, along with the physical activity, banana peel. That's it for Did You Ever See a Kiwi? And don't forget to kick it up. The objectives for Lesson 6A, Ole Beans Ole, are for students to be able to identify foods from the protein foods group, prepare a healthy recipe using beans, use hot pads to handle hot foods, and identify safe storage methods for foods in this group. Here we go. Welcome back. We are talking about the protein foods today, so we're going to be using my plate again as the reference, show the students that the purple group is the protein group. In order to do this, the core activity is called the bean bag toss. And when you toss a bag to one of the students, they will catch it, and they will name a protein food. And after they have named a protein food, they will toss it to someone else. Now, if they don't name a protein food, it is okay. The other students can help them name one, but go ahead and let everyone participate. That's the whole um, thing about these lessons, is you want group participation. Also, another activity that's really fun and educational is having different kinds of beans in different bags. So you might have well, maybe five to ten different types of beans that the students can identify or guess what they are by the color or by the way they look. So this is another fun thing to do. And since you're talking about beans here, that will lead right off into the recipe, which is called Ole Frijoles Dip. And this is a recipe that they chose because in Mexico they eat a lot of beans. We will be needing a microwave for this recipe. We will also be using pot holders or hot pads. Also, we want to make sure that students know that they need to be using microwavable safe dishes in the microwave. They will need a spoon. They will need a can opener to open the beans with. And they will also need measuring cups. Also, when they are opening the can with the can opener, Remind students they need to wash the top of the can. They also need to promptly wash the um, can opener because we don't want germs getting on the can opener. Also go ahead, there's a reference sheet to microwave safety. They need to be going over, you need to go over this with your students as well. Our alternate recipe today would be snack pizza. And the alternate physical activity is pizza push. That's it for Olay Beans Olay and don't forget to kick it up. The objectives for Lesson 7A, Does It Taste the Same?, are for students to be able to identify foods from the dairy group Identify and taste different types of milk. Identify signs of spoilage in milk and other dairy foods. And prepare a healthy recipe using milk. Let's get started. Hello. Today we're going to be talking about the dairy group. And the dairy group is the blue portion of my plate. You want to make sure students understand that they drink three cups of milk every day for strong bones and teeth. You may want to tell your students the different types of dairy foods that there are. And also, you might want to tell the students there's different kinds of milk, different types of milk, and then ask them what type of milk they drink. For example, maybe they drink skim milk. They might not know what that is. They may just drink whole milk. But tell them there's different types of milk. There's also cheese in this group, all kinds of cheese, soft cheese and hard cheese. There's also yogurt and other items that they can eat from this group. In this lesson, you will want to stress food safety, such as always keeping your yogurt, your milk, your cottage cheese, whatever's in the dairy group, refrigerated. Otherwise, bacteria can grow at room temperature and spoil these foods. 
You will also want to go over some of the other issues with milk products such as mold can grow on cheese and they shouldn't eat or smell mold. You can tell students that an adult can cut away the mold in the cheese if it's hard and that way it would be safe to eat. Sometimes they might find their yogurt container and ha open it up and find a little bit of water. And some students say, well, is that safe to eat? And you can tell them, yes, that is safe to eat. That is the way uh, from the milk on the top of the yogurt. That is safe. Also, if they go to the refrigerator and they smell their milk and it's sour, you might tell them, you could drink that milk, but it wouldn't taste good. It's not going to hurt them, but they may not want to drink it just because of the taste. There is also a teacher reference called What Would You Do Situations? And you can make these cards up first, print them out, and then ask these questions to your students. And it get, generates a great discussion for food safety and your dairy products. Milkshake is a physical activity in this lesson. The recipe today is very, very blast. And you will go over in this lesson your equipment, which is very limited here. There's not very much equipment. We have a spatula, we have a liquid measuring cup, and we have a container. And this container is a um, reused cottage cheese container. It's washed out. It's clean and ready to go. If you don't have one of these, hopefully you have something at home with a lid on it. It could be a mason jar or whatever, as long as it has a jar and it's about a quart. So they would be putting their, uh, all of their ingredients into this container. And then the cooking term would be shake it up. Okay, so shake means simply to combine two or more ingredients and back and forth shaking it. That's shake it up. The additional recipe is shake your pudding. The additional physical activity is pudding shake. That's it for does it taste the same and don't forget to kick it up. Hello and welcome to the first lesson of Level B Kitchen Sense. The objectives of this lesson are for the students to be able to determine and follow safety rules for working in the kitchen, recognize unsafe food preparation techniques, wash hands properly, and prepare a healthy recipe. All right, let's get started. The first lesson in Kids in the Kitchen today is called Kitchen Sense. We are going to be going over some food safety rules and some kitchen safety rules. This is very important that um, you stress these rules with kids who may never have been in the kitchen um, and handling some of this equipment by themselves. So the first thing that I do is go over um, the poster with kids and I have kids refer to the handout that you're going to give them. And this is safety rules. I have the kids read these rules because it helps them to uh, remember them and then if there is some discussion or if there are some, some uh, particular areas that kids are not as comfortable with, you can go over those. You can decide to make a poster that you hang in your classroom if you're going to have a, a space that you use the same each time. Um, a lot of times I'm sharing a space with other teachers and so I just have them add those rules into um, their notebook or their recipe box, whatever they're going to be using to keep track of their things. All right, this is a good time to do a physical activity. Germ Buster is the activity that goes with this lesson. It reinforces that we're going to be talking about being food safe and keeping our hands and our workspace clean. This is a good way to get some wiggles out before they need to focus and concentrate when we do the cooking portion. All right, now you're going to do a demonstration for the kids, but you're going to surprise them with how you do this demonstration. This is the contaminated sandwich. This is a very effective visual tool showing the kids what not to do when preparing food. So, you take a piece of bread and you spread with a plastic knife either peanut butter or jelly. Um, I typically use peanut butter, but if you have a peanut butter allergy and can't bring that in with this a particular group of kids, then you can use jelly or honey, something that's sticky and messy. 
And the idea here, when you're spreading that on your bread, is you want to use plastic gloves, you want to get the peanut butter or the jelly everywhere, you want to rub your nose, lick your knife, you might have something on your shoe that you fiddle with. You want to be doing a lot of different things that are breaking all of the kitchen safety rules. So at the end, after I've made the sandwich and kids are usually giggling and um, think it's a pretty funny thing or already pointing out what I've done wrong, I offer it and offer a bite to anyone. Now, because I've made this sandwich, I might, depending on how gross I've gotten, I might take a bite or pretend to take a bite. But the idea is you want to have that dialogue at the end showing the kids that this is not the way that we handle ourselves, our hands, and our instruments when we're cooking. And then this is a really good time for everyone to go wash their hands, yourself included. I like to have a quick discussion, and I usually hold my hands up like this to show the kids that we're going to be making shared food. In Kids in the Kitchen, because of time constraints and preparation and budgets, a lot of times I have kids work in groups and we prepare a recipe together. That means we're sharing food. So now you can refer back not only to the contaminated sandwich demonstration, but also to your food safety rules that you went over at the beginning and talk about the fact that it's very important to keep fingers and hands out of your mouths, out of your hair. If you have backpacks, they need to be in a separate space from where you're cooking. All of those kinds of things to show kids that we really are trying to make sure that we keep each other safe and that our food is good um, to eat and to share. So let's move on to the recipe. For this lesson, we're preparing wheat combo snack mix. This is a great recipe as a beginner and a starter for this set of lessons. But before I do that with students, they may have never read a recipe before. I like to go over a few basics with each recipe that they will be seeing over the next course of your lessons. Ingredients and then directions. Kids have a bad habit of wanting to go down the ingredients and put everything in one bowl at one time. My tip for them and for you teaching is to very much stress the directions. And if you're demonstrating at a table and they're following along at their groups, you can go through step by step and have them prepare recipe along with you so that you're all at the same pace. That's not a bad idea to do the first couple of times you meet with students. You may work up to them preparing a recipe on their own by looking at ingredients and then following directions. So, one of the handouts kids will get with this lesson is electric skillet safety. Now, I include this in their packet, but I really prefer to use an actual electric skillet to demonstrate a couple of the important safety rules. First of all, I like kids to know that this is very hot. It gets hot on the bottom, and I show them on the back the spots where it gets hot. It heats from the bottom. Also, I show the kids the part that plugs in. This is very important because at the end of every cooking lesson, kids clean up. And this cannot be submersed in water. It also has to be plugged in and unplugged when you're using it. Here's another important piece of this lesson. The prong is the part that gets hot. So if kids plug this into the wall first, there's the potential to burn themselves. I always stress, no matter what age group I'm working with, that it is very, very important to plug this in first and then plug it into the wall. You don't want to plug this part into the wall and then have this potentially turned on. That could be a very big safety issue with kids. So after they're finished cooking, they will wash. And I always like to demonstrate that I want them to have the part that plugs in facing up and to wash it like this so that this plug doesn't go underwater. We can also go over the rules with them depending on how much time you have. And you can have students read off of the handout the different rules for electric skillet safety. Now let's get to preparing the recipe. 
What I usually do is break the kids into groups and they have to prepare the recipe along with me and I'm demonstrating and they're in their groups and they're making. So for this lesson, we need the big cup and I might just set out the big cup because depending on the age and the skill level of your kids, it might take them a lot of time to go through and find different ones. So they're going to add their ingredients in, taking turns depending on your group size. They're going to mix everything up after they've measured and poured in their cereal and their spices. And then they're going to cook. Now this is a part where we need to have a little bit of cooperation with kids because typically I only have one electric skillet and I may have them divided into three or four groups that have all prepared a recipe. So they will bring their bowl up, and just like the recipe says on number six, they're going to pour it into the skillet, and then I will have someone from that group stir in the skillet until it's nicely toasted. And then typically on the first lesson, because the skillet's hot, I'll help them, and they'll pour it back into their same bowl and as it's cooling and they take it back and they're waiting for other kids, then we'll portion it out into cups or plastic bags for them to take home. At the end of each lesson, there's always a way to kick it up. Now, kick it up lessons can be used independently, or if you have lots of time and lots of resources, they can be used in addition. With lesson 1B, the recipe is blueberry banana sundaes. These Kick It Up lessons focus on physical activity and a simple recipe that doesn't require a lot of supplies and it doesn't require a kitchen. They'd be perfect for an outside, a summer school, or an after school program. I encourage you to use these lessons um, in a variety of different ways. I hope that this Kids in the Kitchen Lesson 1 has been useful for you. Good luck and happy cooking. Welcome to Lesson 2B the incredible edible five food groups. The objectives for this lesson are for students to be able to identify foods from each of the five food groups, prepare a healthy snack using ingredients from these food groups, understand the importance of eating from all the food groups so our bodies get all the nutrients we need. All right, so for this lesson, we're going to be focusing on the My Plate poster and all five food groups. While this may be a review for some students, this may be something that uh, is the first time that some of your students have heard it. So we're going to talk about all five food groups. And according to the curriculum, you can ask some questions like, is there one food that covers all of your nutritional needs? Or is there one superfood? And usually I'll ask a couple of those questions and kids will say no. And then we talk about the why. Most kids and most adults don't get enough of the nutrients that are found in the five food groups. So we want to stress a uh, focus um, on a healthy balance of choosing foods from all five food groups. So for the first um, activity, we're going to do a bingo game. I have two examples of the worksheet. Time permitting, you can either have the students fill in names from each food group of different foods, or you can give them a list and have them write them down. For me, I typically give them five foods from each food group, and I'll list them several times, and they can fill them in wherever they want. Like on line one, they're going to fill in for the grain group either cereal, rice, bread, pasta, or crackers. And then I'll do that for each of the other four food groups that remain. When we play this game, I brought some food cards and I chose only the five from each food group that I have. Then, as the leader, I will select a card and they X off their spot on their bingo card. This game isn't necessarily meant to play a true game of bingo. It's just meant to reinforce and to visually show them the five food groups and different foods that, go, that fit into each food group. After you play the My Bingo, this is a really fun time to get them up and moving. You can do both activities this time. Pump 
and the other one, the cereal shrug. All right, we're going to do another little game. And this is the food groups with name two game. And I like to use my plastic apple and have the kids sit in a circle. They're going to pass this around, the circle, and as the leader, I will call out a food group. When I call out a food group, they, whoever has the apple stops, and they have to name two foods from that food group. Now there's another way to do this game. You can have a student sit in the middle, and they're the leader, and they'll call out a food group. It just depends on the flexibility of your group, the maturity of your group, and what they can handle. So the idea with that game, again, is just getting them thinking about what foods are grains, what foods are vegetables, what foods are fruits, what foods are dairy, and what foods are protein. Because all of those foods make up my plate. So now let's get to the recipe. We're going to be making the breakfast banana split. And we're going to be focusing on sprinkle. Now there are a couple of things interesting with this recipe. They're not going to be cooking, and they're going to only be preparing for one. So for this recipe, you're gonna need either a cereal bowl or a plate and some serving spoons or eating cereal spoons. And then they're going to be using a couple of different items, measuring cups, measuring spoons, and a can opener. There are some really important things to go over when teaching kids how to use a can opener. A lot of kids probably have never used one. I'm left-handed, so I do mine a little bit backwards. But there is a right and a wrong way to use a can opener. Some kids might try to put it upside down and it won't do anything. So really demonstrating how that works and opening a can and showing kids how that works is a really good um, demonstration to do. Also, having kids practice. And canned goods usually are pretty inexpensive. If you can get several to have them open cans, that's great. I want to stress that they need to wash the top of their can. I also want to stress at the end they need to rinse their can opener. Germs do collect on can openers and a lot of times if we open a can of tuna and then we open a can of pineapple, we might contaminate that food. So I always stress with kids that this is a tool that needs to be washed. All right, back to the recipe. Breakfast banana splits. Like I said, they're going to be focusing on sprinkle. So they have a banana. They will need to wash that banana. Washing the outside of fruit is important because germs that are on our hands and on that fruit could contaminate the inside of the fruit. They might laugh at washing a banana because they might have never done that before. But it's an important uh, concept for the kids to understand and a, ha a good habit for them to get into. So they'll wash the banana, then they'll peel it and put it into their bowl. The next step then is going to be sprinkling some cereal over their banana. Then they'll, they will be spooning some yogurt. They will be measuring out some honey or some cottage cheese, depending on the ingredients that you choose. This recipe gives you a little bit of flexibility. Then they'll be decorating with their pineapple, and that's where the can opener comes into play. This recipe also has dairy, and dairy needs to be refrigerated. So whether you have a cooler or you have a refrigerator in your cooking area, this is also a good instructional moment to show the kids that your yogurt or your cottage cheese needs to stay cold until you're ready to use it. All right, one note, you can substitute, like I said, cottage cheese. You can also substitute different flavors of yogurt. When you're purchasing, you need to check and make sure um, some yogurts that are flavored have a higher sugar content. And since we're trying to make all healthy recipes, I want you to be a good label searcher as the instructor and check the, the ingredients or the label on the yogurt that you're picking. All right, that's all for the five food groups and don't forget to kick it up. Welcome to lesson 3B, Choose Whole Grains. The objectives of this lesson are for students to be able to identify the grain group as a good source of fiber, vitamins, and minerals. 
Compare labels of foods between those containing whole grains and those containing refined grains. Prepare a healthy recipe using whole grains. Measure the ingredients correctly and use safe cooking techniques with the stove, oven, skillet, and electric griddle. All right, today we're going to be focusing on the grain group. And grains have a lot of different types of foods in there, and a lot of times kids are pretty confused about grains. Most kids can tell you that grains are bread. But our goal today is to show them that grains can be a whole lot more. Grains give us energy, so grains are a really important food group. All right, so we're going to start off the lesson by giving them some demonstrations and examples to look at. Kids love hands-on. I have some pieces of wheat. I also have some that I pass around for kids that's just laminated between two pieces of plastic. And they're able to look at them, but they can't necessarily see the texture. I also have white flour and whole wheat flour. So what I do with these is they're just, it's just flour in a baggie, pretty easy to do yourself. But I like to let kids feel the difference. White flour is real soft and fluffy. And when they feel the wheat flour, they can feel the grains in between their fingers. And I just tell them to just rub like this and they can feel the grains in between their fingers. Then if you have other types of examples, you can bring those. You can either use a grain board or you can make up some examples. This happens to be some tubes, and they can see the grains of wheat that are ground into whole grain or white flour. So those are really nice visual examples to show kids and talk, start talking to them about grains. One of the games that we're going to play is called, How Many Grain Foods Do We Eat? And this is a great, fun game that the kids like to play. Sit them in a circle and I just use my food model cards, pass out a card to each kid, and what you have them do is the first student will hold up their card in the circle and they'll say, I have pasta, and pasta is in the grain group. And then the next student will say, I have whole wheat bread. Whole wheat bread and pasta are in the grain group. And then the third kid says, I have cereal. Cereal and whole wheat bread and pasta are in the grain group. The idea is just to get them thinking about different foods, some that they may not have thought of that are in the grain group. I like to especially bring in pictures of rice or popcorn because those are also grains and a lot of times kids don't think about those being good healthy grains for them to eat that give them lots of energy. This is my, one of my favorite activities. It's called Measure It Right. Now with Measure It Right, I laminated some cards that just have different measurements that they have to accomplish. Using flour, water, and salt, I like to set up three different stations, letting kids practice their measuring skills. For instance, when I have a dry measure station set up, they have to find one cup and one third. So this time, I have not separated out the measuring cups. They have to look and find the measurement, which is using a little bit of math and also using their skills in measuring. So I have a big bowl with flour, and I will have the kids measure one cup, and then they also have to measure one-third. I want you to have the kids level their measuring cup. So when they scoop the flour in, they'll need to hold it over that bowl and they'll need to level it off. This makes sure that they have a nice level one-third measurement because when you're doing baked goods, it's a science experiment and you need to make sure that your ingredients are exact. Same thing goes when they're measuring with the teaspoons and they're using salt. So on this measurement, I'm going to have them find the difference between a tablespoon and a teaspoon. These are two of the more common measurements and lots of people get them confused. So table is big, just like this table, and tea is little. 
So that's one of the ways that I help them to remember the difference between a tablespoon and a teaspoon. You can take this a step further by showing them the abbreviations. Tablespoon is typically abbreviated TB in capital letters, and you can show them that on a recipe. Teaspoon is typically abbreviated TSP in lowercase. That's how they can know the difference, and if you mess that up, your recipe might not turn out. So that's a good thing to stress to kids, too. All right, and the third measurement they're going to try, and this is not one that they've done yet, is liquid measure. This is a different type of measuring cup, and the kids will need to get at eye level in order to make sure that the water is measured up to the line. Now, the one that I picked for them to measure are two-thirds and one-fourth. Those are some tricky ones to find, and I want to have the kids search to see if they can find two-thirds and one-fourth. I typically don't have them get water out of the faucet. I usually just make this another station like we did with the flour and the salt, and I'll put water in a bowl. They can scoop it out, and it's fun to watch the kids because they get pretty competitive, and they might pour just drops out at a time to make sure that they have it exactly at two-thirds or at exactly at one-fourth. So this is another important type of measurement and a good one to um, show them another hands-on demonstration about the importance of accurate measuring when you're cooking. After we've done that activity, you can throw in a physical activity at this time. The whole wheat wiggle goes along with this lesson, but because the um, how many grain foods pass it around game and the measure it right activity are up and moving around, you may or may not need to use this activity. Now we're going to move into the cooking. For this one, we're going to be doing freckle popovers. Now we're using eggs. This is an ingredient that we haven't used so far, so I'd like to talk for just a moment about egg safety. I like to make sure that I talk to the kids for sure about washing hands after they've cracked their eggs. Um, I like to talk about keeping eggs refrigerated. And I like to talk about looking at the expiration date on the end of the carton to make sure that those eggs are safe to eat. Um, also, we want to talk about not eating anything that is mixed with raw eggs. So today we're making popovers, and in a minute we'll be using another recipe that has egg in it. It's very tempting um, to taste brownie batter or cookie dough or cake batter, but it's not safe and it's not recommended. Now sometimes with older kids, they might want to challenge you and say that they've done it before and they haven't gotten sick. And what I want uh, my response to those kids is to say, well, then you're lucky because it only takes once to get sick and you'll know it. And salmonella is not something to be messed with. That's a bacteria that can make you very, very sick. So when we're making freckle popovers, there are a couple of things besides egg that we need to pay attention to that we haven't used yet. We're going to be using a toaster oven, and this is a handout that will go in their packet or in their recipe box. Toaster oven can be a handy tool to use instead of an oven. And it also can be a tool that kids can use possibly at home if they're just beginning cooking. But let's go over a couple of safety things with the toaster oven. I want to show the kids when I open the door that the rack automatically slides out. I want to also stress that that rack inside the toaster oven is hot when the oven is on. Now the toaster oven will need to be plugged in. It will need to be turned to the proper temperature and allowed time to preheat before they put their food in to cook. Most of the time, the toaster oven also has a timer and a bell that will go off at the end, which makes monitoring for beginning cooks a lot easier. Freckle popovers. Some of the tools that you'll need to prepare this recipe, they'll need a big bowl. They'll be using their measuring cups, both liquid and dry and they'll be using the measuring spoons. Here's where I want you to have the kids practice breaking an egg. Now this recipe only calls for one egg, but if you have the budget to allow, it's a great idea to get several eggs. You can possibly save to use for something else and let the kids practice breaking. For this recipe in particular, 
And we're going to crack an egg into a separate cup to make sure that they look for shells. Some kids have never broken an egg before and this might be something brand new for them to try and it might get a little messy. After they check for shells and they rinse their hands off from any raw egg that might be on their hands, they can use a fork or a whisk to mix that egg up and I want them to then pour that into their mixing bowl. After they've scooped this into the muffin pan, I want them to check their recipe, make sure they've already preheated at the 400 degrees, but they need to check the time. So they'll set their timer, and after it goes off, then I want them to use a hot pad or two hot pads to remove the hot muffin pan from the toaster oven. After they cook the popovers and they taste them, if there are leftovers, you need to talk to them about storing them in the refrigerator. Now some bread and grain products typically can be stored on the countertop, but because this has eggs in it, it has to be stored in the refrigerator, and that's an important note to make sure that kids know the difference about. This lesson has an additional recipe with it. They're going to be making perfect pumpkin pancakes. This is a great recipe to show kids how using baking powder can help something to rise. So for this recipe, they're going to be measuring out flour and brown sugar, baking powder, and pumpkin pie spice and salt. We want to measure those into a bowl first. In a separate bowl, they're going to measure their wet ingredients, which will be their egg, their canned pumpkin, milk, and whisk those together, then combine. When we combine them, they're going to stir very gently, reminding the kids that baking powder is involved. And again, I like to stress that this is a science experiment. They want to see what's going to happen at the end. If their pancakes didn't have baking powder, they'd be very, very thin. But because they have baking powder, they're going to rise and puff up. That's the science behind cooking. So they're going to mix very gently those wet and dry ingredients together. And then I like to give the kids a scoop. And I usually use one of my smaller measuring scoops. And we're going to use the electric skillet, spraying it with cooking spray. And they'll scoop their pancake batter in order to let that have a uniform look so that all the pancakes are relatively the same size. All right, here's the fun. When they start to bubble and look a little cooked on the outside, then I'll let the kids practice flipping the pancakes. If they've never done this, they love this part. And then I usually have a plate or some kind of big serving tray to put all of the pancakes on, and then at the end, we can serve them and taste them. That's all we've got for Choose Whole Grains. Don't forget to kick it up. Welcome back. This is Lesson 4B, I'll Eat These Veggies. The objectives of this lesson are for students to be able to identify the vegetable group as a good source of fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Identify that vegetables are high in vitamin A. Identify different parts of plants that are eaten as vegetables. Prepare a healthy recipe using vegetables. And handle knives, peelers, and handheld choppers safely. Hi there, welcome to the veggie lesson. Today we are going to focus on all of these veggies that you see before us and many, many more. This is a great lesson because so many kids do not get enough vegetables, but letting them have a hands-on opportunity to cut and chop and taste really opens their eyes and opens their taste buds to some new vegetables that they may not have had before. So the very first activity is Riddlelicious. This is um, a handout that you can use. There's also a teacher reference page. What I like to do with this age kids is I like to pick just a few of these, hand, of these questions that focus more on vegetables and read them and let the kids try to guess the answer. If you have a higher learning um, level of kids, you might want to let them read and write down answers, but that also can take up a lot of time and there's a lot of good activities in this lesson to focus on. 
All right, so when you're talking about veggies, you really want to open up the discussion to talk about um, the green portion of my plate and talk about the fact that kids get vitamins, minerals, and fiber from vegetables, and that most of us, kids and adults, don't eat enough vegetables. In fact, we're going to focus on vitamin A. Vitamin A comes from those dark green, those red, and those orange vegetables, a lot of these that I've got laid before us. So one of the really great activities with this lesson is called Go Eat a Plant. There are a couple of ways that you can do this lesson, or this portion of the lesson. You can go eat a plant by laying out all of these different uh, parts of the vegetable and having them match them up as where they, are, where they grow on the plant. You can also do what I've done and use plastic vegetables. So we've got the leaves, we've got the root, we've got the stem, flower, fruit, and seeds. And it's a really fun activity to let the kids kind of match up on their handout and their worksheet where these different parts uh, grow on the plant. Because like we, like we talk about in nutrition, we've got on the my plate, we've got veggies. But when we're talking about cooking our parts of the plant, there are no vegetables. It's just different parts of the plant. So it's fun for kids to kind of see where they come from. And they're always interested to see that the fruit can be called a vegetable, but it's really that fruit part of the plant. So here's a really good time after you do this activity with the kids. We're going to do the carrot peel because we've got to do another physical activity in there. Then we move on. We're going to talk about knife safety. OK. A lot of reading there, a lot of different measurements. With this age kids, really a great idea to show them hands-on what you're talking about. Obviously, kids are going to associate this with a knife. Most kids will realize the bottom part is sharp, the top part is not, and the pointy end can also be pretty dangerous. So we're going to talk to them about different ways to clean knives, different types of knives, but I like to bring in the fact that there are other things that are sharp and need to be considered with as much care as knives. So our vegetable grater or peelers, we've got the peeler here, and I've got a couple of handheld for younger kids that might just be learning how to use these. And I really like to demonstrate and really stress the fact with this age of kids that these are blades also and they're very sharp. Now, we've got three recipes to pick from. We have farmer's market salsa, veggie pillows, and veggie mix. If you're extremely ambitious, you can try all three recipes with your students. However, the taste of these three recipes might not complement each other, so you might want to just pick one. I'm going to talk about the farmer's market salsa. This is a great recipe. Most kids are accustomed to chips and salsa. So you serve this with tortilla chips, but they do all the cutting and chopping. It's a great way to practice all of those knife skills that they've just learned. You can use some of the terms that are on the paper, such as chop, cut, dice. And I like to stress with kids when we do this activity or this recipe that we want to use bite-sized pieces. No one wants to dip their chip in and take a bite of salsa and have a huge piece of green pepper or onion. So we talk about bite size or dice, which is one of the cooking terms that we're learning in this lesson. So we're going to use our grater. We're going to use our peelers. We'll use our cutting board. We'll use our knives. This is a great way to separate the kids, give them different opportunities to cut different vegetables, put them all in the bowl, Mix them up with a little bit of spice or seasonings, and then taste them with the chips. That's really all for veggies, and don't forget to kick it up. Have fun. Hello again. The objectives for this lesson, Lesson 5B, Fantastic Fruits, are for students to be able to Identify the fruit group as a good source of fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Identify that fruits are high in vitamin C. 
Prepare a healthy recipe using fruit. Wash and store fruit correctly. Explain how to prevent browning of cut fruit. And handle knives and peelers safely. Hi there. Today we're going to talk about fantastic fruit. Most kids don't have a problem tasting fruit. Fruit is naturally sweet, and that's why we call it nature's candy. But there are a couple of things that I'd like you to stress with kids when you're talking about fruit. It's the red portion of my plate, and it's high in vitamins, minerals, fiber. We're going to focus especially on vitamin C and try to help kids understand that oranges, strawberries, citrus fruits are very high in vitamin C, Vitamin C helps to fight germs and keeps our bodies healthy. I usually like to, at this point, discuss um, and give the kids an option to talk about their favorite fruit. I have a few examples out on the table that we're going to use for some other activities. Using food models or food cards is a great way to show them some pictures of different fruits or if you have the resources to bring in some um, exotic fruits or some tropical fruits that they may not have seen before. After you talk about fruit and talk about which ones kids have tasted, let's do a physical activity. The pineapple stretch. Here's a great one to segue into what you're going to talk about next. After we do that stretch, we're going to do a demonstration to show kids about food safety, especially about the importance of washing your hands and your fruit, because a lot of times kids don't think about the germs that linger on the outside of fruit, especially fruit that has a peel. Let me show you a handy tool that we have. This is called Glow Potion. And the Glow Potion is great because it shows up under a black light. Whether you have a handheld or this big bar, either one will work for this activity. What I'd like you to do is practice before you use this because it has a tendency to go everywhere. So you use the Glow Potion and you can cover something like a fake piece of fruit hold it under a black light, and it will show up, and it mimics what germs might look like, because to the naked eye, you can't see it. Under the black light, it will show up. So with this activity in this particular lesson, what we're going to do is, before the kids get there, or when they're not looking, or somehow, I want you to cover one of those pieces of fruit with the glow potion. And again, it'll rub in, it won't hurt your uh, fruit at all. This is non-toxic and safe. And for purposes today, I have plastic fruit. Obviously, you'd want to do this demonstration with real fruit because here's what you're going to do. We're going to cover that banana with some glow potion. And then we're going to have two students come up. They're going to each peel their particular fruit. What will happen with the one covered in glow potion is their hands will transfer and pick up that glow lotion and then the peeled piece of fruit when you say now break off and taste a piece of that banana they will taste it what happens again and make sure you, uh, that you remind students or parents that might be concerned that this is completely safe to use turn the lights off and pause the students and have everyone look to see this one doesn't have anything on it. We're going to say that this was the piece of fruit where the student washed their hands and their piece of fruit. This one was not. So this one will show the germs that transferred to the actual banana from the peel. Here's kind of a fun activity that you can send home with students. This is called Grow Your Own Pineapple. Now a lot of kids may have tasted canned pineapple maybe on their school lunch tray or maybe at home but fresh pineapple sometimes tends to be a little more expensive at the store or maybe just a little intimidating looking what I'd like you to do is offer the students an opportunity to come up touch the pineapple look at it really inspect it because pineapples can look a little scary they're kind of sharp and pokey on the outside but here's a skill you're going to show only by demonstration, but they're going to be able to go home and talk to mom and dad about how to do this and hopefully encourage them to try fresh pineapple. So I want you to use a knife. I have a plastic one today, but you're going to lay it on its side. And in your curriculum, there are step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. If you've never peeled a pineapple, you might want to practice before you do this in front of kids. 
but you're going to cut the top off, you'll cut the bottom off, and then you'll peel down or just slice down each side. Then you'll have a nice big piece of pineapple that looks just like kids might have seen if they've seen cord pineapple for sale in a container in the grocery store. You can then at that point cut it up and offer kids samples or you can save it and use it with the fruit combo with lava sauce because this actually calls for fresh pineapple and pineapple juice. Now the recipe that we're going to focus on today is actually the pocket fruit pies. Now while you could use some of that fresh pineapple, I would suggest just offering that for taste if this is the recipe that you're planning to use. So the pocket fruit pies uses whole wheat tortillas. You're going to fill them with a filling that you measure and stir together in your bowl. And then you're going to toast them in the toaster oven. All right, remember, you want to make sure that you wash your fruit before you eat it, even fruit that has a peel. You don't want those germs to transfer from the outside of the peel or your hands to the inside of the fruit that you're going to put in your mouth. That's about all we have for fruit today. Don't forget to kick it up. Hello, the objectives for Lesson 6B, Beans, Beans, and More Beans, are for students to be able to identify the protein foods group as a good source of protein, B vitamins, and iron. Prepare a healthy recipe using beans. Identify safe storage methods for foods from the protein foods group. Practice safe cooking techniques with the microwave oven, conventional oven, and toaster oven. Hi there. All right, so today for this lesson we're going to talk about protein foods. Protein foods is the purple part of the my plate. Protein builds muscle and it helps to repair the body. Most kids get plenty of protein, but a lot of times kids don't know all the different foods that are part of the protein group. So in order to reinforce the different protein foods, we're going to play a game called the name game. In the name game, you can set this up a couple of different ways. It's basically a beanbag toss game, and you're going to have the kids in a circle, and you're going to toss the beanbag to a child and ask them a question. Now, in the instructions for the name game, it suggests naming different types of beans, because both of our recipes today focus on beans. What I like to do is bring a hands-on visual of different types of beans. Kids, a lot of times, may not have seen these different beans or tasted them. These are dried beans, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But for the name game, I've adapted it just a bit to encompass all of the different types of protein foods. So what I like to do is toss the bean bag and say meat, beans, eggs, nuts, or fish and let the kids pick one of those things and maybe how they would prepare it or how they would eat it because those are all protein foods. Protein foods come from both animals and plants and kids a lot of times get confused because all of those different foods are in this same food group. So a fun game, it also reinforces that concept. That's just a couple of suggestions on how to adapt that game for your group. Let's do a physical activity. The one we're going to do is jumping beans. Kids like this one, they can jump all over the place, and at this time you could even call out different names of the beans, like the example that you brought with the dried beans. In the recipes, we need to address some of those safety handouts. So in previous lessons, we've talked about using a can opener, but it's a good idea again to go over the can opener and give kids the reminder that that is a blade and how they want to use that blade and, and how they want to wash off the top of their can and rinse off the can opener when they're finished. All right, depending on what kind of oven you're using, we've got all three different safety um, tip sheets for oven use. We can either use a standard oven, we can use a toaster oven like the one I've got, or you can use a microwave with these recipes. All right, so let's get to the recipes. With this lesson, we'll be preparing ole frijoles dip and tempting tostadas. In this recipe, 
You can point out to the kids that frijoles stands for beans in Spanish, and that's kind of a fun little tip. Now both of these recipes are very similar, so you might not want to make both, maybe just choose one, and if you have time, you could do the kick it up recipe at the end. All right, so there are a couple of terms. I've talked about um, this in previous lessons, but I want to bring them to your attention again. One I want to talk about today is melt. Melt is a safety issue with kids, and they might not be aware, or they might not have thought through it. But you can give the example, how many of you have ever taken a sip of hot soup and burned the roof of your mouth? A lot of times kids have, or they've burned their tongue sipping hot cocoa. Melt and cheese are two things that we need to be aware of bringing to kids' attention, especially when we're wanting them to pull items out of a hot oven, a microwave, or a toaster oven. Melted cheese can be a real burn issue, and we don't want any accidents to happen in, in our Kids in the Kitchen class. All right, so both of these recipes also are focusing on canned beans. I want to bring back my example again. And although these dried beans are not particularly in the curriculum, I suggest bringing them because canned beans are extremely inexpensive and easy to cook. You can bring that in and talk to kids about cooking dried beans where they soak them, cover them with water, and simmer them for several hours, and they make a great tasty treat that are full of protein. For time purposes in our classes, we're using canned beans. One of the comments that I'd like to add in is rinse those canned beans before you use them in your recipes. It'll make them taste better, and it'll reduce some of the sodium and some of that liquid that's in the canned beans that might seem unappetizing to kids. Other than that, that's about all we have for protein. Don't forget to kick it up. Welcome back to the seventh and final lesson of Level B. Does it taste the same? The objectives for this lesson are for students to be able to identify the dairy group as a good source of calcium, identify and taste different types of milk, identify signs of spoilage in milk and other dairy foods, recognize how to use the sell-by date on dairy foods, and prepare a healthy recipe using milk. Hi there, today we're going to talk about dairy foods. Dairy's the blue portion of my plate and this kind of wraps up our series with Level B. So I want you to make sure that you remind the kids that uh, dairy foods contain calcium, good for uh, strong bones and healthy teeth. That's just a reminder. You also want to incorporate as many times as you can into this lesson that kids need three cups a day. Just want that number to stick in their head when you're teaching this lesson. This activity is called uh, tasting milk. And so what we're going to do is pour different kinds of milk into three different cups. By different kinds, I'm not suggesting the cartons that I brought, but we're talking about the fat content of milk. So you want to choose uh, no fat milk, maybe a one or two percent, and then a whole milk, because you really want to give them a difference in how those milks taste. Now, I did bring some props. And the reason I brought those is because depending on budget, you may not be able to purchase all three different types of milk, or you may be doing this activity outside, and this is still a really good lesson to concentrate on. So you could, at that point, look at the label of these different types of milk, and you could talk about them with kids. But I'm pretty hands-on, and I like to give them the opportunity to taste whenever they can. So after the kids have tasted the different types of milk, and there is an obvious taste difference, you can talk about that, and they're supposed to choose and kind of match up which type of milk they think um, that they're tasting. I brought my fat tubes. Here's a really good visual illustration for kids to see the difference in why that whole milk tastes real creamy and has a real milk taste, and maybe why that skim milk is a whole lot colder and doesn't have as much flavor. This is the fat content of skim milk. The fat content is very small, which means that the milk doesn't have as much taste or flavor or maybe feel in their mouth. This is the fat content of a cup of whole milk. So quite a bit of difference. It's nice to compare. It's nice to show kids exactly what that comparison looks like. All right. After we do that, let's pull in some physical activity. We've got two of them this time. 
You can do the milkshake with kids. And then you can do the cheesy choice. Then an activity that you're going to do, and this is not a handout, this is a teacher reference page. It's the what would you do food safety. Milk and dairy foods have tons of opportunities to talk about food safety. Foods need to go in the refrigerator, foods have an expiration date, and there's really a lot of good scenarios on that teacher reference page. They're just questions that open up discussion for kids. So make sure you use some of those, incorporate them in. Some, depending on the age of your kids here, because we've got that middle age of students, some may be a little over their head, but challenge them and help them to think about that because you want to stress that dairy foods need to always be refrigerated. And then you want to show them, especially with the items that we're going to use in today's recipe, one of the items is refrigerated and one is frozen. So let's get to the recipes. All right, one of your handouts is how to use a blender. I'd like to talk about that and kind of walk you through the blender for a minute. There's a couple of really important things about the blender. First of all, we never want to submerge this bottom portion in water. So this is the part that always stays dry. You can wipe it off with a cloth if it gets splatters on it. This part, the whole thing, can be submerged in water. A lot of times this bottom will unscrew for safer washing. I'm going to show you the inside. The inside of this blender is a blade. So what we want to do is make sure that kids aren't reaching down in there with their hands to try to wash this off. Using real hot soapy water and giving this a real good rinse will get this clean. If you need to run it through a dishwasher or something like that after the class, that would be appropriate. But let's stress to kids that this is a blade down in here. It's kind of like knife safety. And we want to be careful when they're cleaning it. The other thing is when using a blender, disasters could happen. This lid's going to seal on and I want you to make sure that you have kids use two hands. Push that lid on tight and I always tell my kids, even if I'm working with older students, when they push the button they're going to hold the handle and then while it's running they're going to have a hand on top of the lid. Because I want to make sure that we don't have an accident and if they haven't gotten that securely on, it could come off while the blender's running. All right, so not too difficult, but a couple of safety tips that will ensure that your classroom isn't a big cleanup at the end. Shamrock shakes. This is a pretty simple recipe today, but because we've had a lot of the other things and if we incorporated the milk tasting, this is just going to be a nice supplement recipe for them to be able to practice their skills using the blender. And also there's that banana from a previous lesson. Remember to wash the outside before they peel and chop that banana. All right, the Word for the day on shamrock shakes is blend. I want to make sure that when they put all of their ingredients in, that they're properly blending. And that's one of the buttons on the blender. Let me go back real quick and remind you that your milk needs to stay cold, so bring a cooler if you don't have access to a refrigerator. And this recipe uses ice cream. It'll need to stay in the freezer. If you don't have opportunity to use a freezer, you might want to check out the Kick It Up recipe. That's about it for dairy. Don't forget, kick it up. Hello and welcome to the first lesson of Level C, Kitchen Sense. The objectives of this lesson are for the students to be able to recognize safety rules for working in the kitchen, recognize unsafe food preparation techniques, wash their hands properly, prepare a healthy recipe, and recognize how to properly handle eggs. So, if you're ready, let's get started. Hello, this is Kids in the Kitchen 1C. C stands for the older kids in this case, so it's junior high, to lower high school age kids. It's a great bunch to work with and a fun bunch. One of the first things I do to start with is kind of go over my own classroom rules. You'll get your own classroom rules and be, you know, be sure that you share those with them right from the start. That way you don't have any problems with all the other lessons as well. Next, we get started. First thing, one of the first things I do is give them a folder. Um, this way they can keep all recipes 
any handouts I give them in this folder. So being able to keep this folder is important for them for every, every lesson that we do. And the reason I chose this folder is if you open it up, it's kind of a cheat sheet. Um, it gives all the abbreviations of tablespoon, teaspoon, cups. It does all the work for them. Um, it's a good one for them to keep, even to use later. After that, we get started on the safety rules working in the kitchen. When it comes to the safety rules, I kind of let them at this age address me with what they think some of the safety rules will be. You'll find that they pretty much get most of the safety rules, washing their hands and so on. After we're done discuss discussing it though, I find that I still need to go over them just so that they have the safety rules and in case they might have forgot any that might be on there. At that point, I also will give them the safety rules for teens. This is the one that they can put in their folder and I tell them, we'll be looking back at it the next lesson because we will be using it for all the lessons working in the kitchen. So this one goes into their folder. After the thanks safety, we get to some fun part. The contaminated sandwich is the activity that we're gonna do. The contaminated sandwich, I love this activity and you're gonna do it just a little bit um, more age appropriate. Some of the things that you might wanna do if you were doing younger, like picking your nose, might not necessarily be the case in junior high. So I never <laughs> take a cell phone into classroom with me. And my kids know they're not allowed to have their uh, cell phones on when we're in class either. But this is the one time I do bring my cell phone with me because it's something they have with them all the time. They don't even realize sometimes how much they're touching buttons and how much bacteria could be on their phone. So one of the first things I do is go over with them that if you're gonna cook in the kitchen and you have hair that is longer than about this long, you need to put it up. But instead of moving away from the kitchen area to put my hair up like I normally would, I just do it right over the food. That way they can see safety rule number one broke. So I'll just pull my hair up, clip it right here. A lot of times I make it a little more dramatic. I'll flip my hair down so that my head is over the table and clip it up. Um, after that, I start making the sandwich. All you're gonna need is some peanut butter, jelly, knife, bread. Break any rules that you can think, but just kind of keep it age appropriately. I do always put gloves on because I want them to see how safe I'm being, but at the same time, I'm probably gonna scratch my hair. I'm gonna go ahead as I'm fixing the peanut butter. Um, I'm going to text at the same time or answer my phone. Um, I will tell you, I've even had my daughter send me a text so that it buzzes while I'm doing it just so they could know somebody was calling me and I went ahead and answered it. Do as many things that you think is more their age to contaminate the sandwich. When you're done, ask who would like this sandwich. You're going to find they have lots of reasons not to eat that sandwich and that kind of brings a discussion. A lot of times I will go ahead when I start to and throw a dish towel over my shoulder and wipe my hands on it as I go also. Most of them don't see anything wrong with that. It's clean dish towel. <laughs> the fact that it's on my shoulder and my hair is all over it doesn't seem to be an issue to them. So it's just a good way to point out some of these things. Another activity that you can do with the dish towels is a germ is issue, and you can use the glow germ and the black light. Put the glow germ on one of the dish towels Make sure that you get it kind of all over and have their hands wiped on the dish towel. The glow germ will then show up on their hands. When they don't know it, then you explain to them. Let's take a look. You use the dish towel. Let's see if there's any germs. Use the black light. Another one that I do in case I don't have time or don't have, have use for the black light, I will just take two dish towels. I will ask them which one is clean. They're both folded, but I'll explain. One came out of the washer been folded, ready to go. The other one I may have just used last night when I fixed chicken to wipe the chicken juice up and to wipe my hands on the whole time I was doing the kitchen. Which one do you think is the clean one? Well, with them folded, they usually can't tell. They think it's kind of a trick and it kind of is because you're not gonna see the bacteria and it kind of brings that point across to them. So either way, works pretty good. Well, since we're talking about mistakes, this is a good time to do the food safety mistakes. In your curriculum, there's a series of a 16 of them. You can divide the class into different groups, three, four, 
however many, depending on your group size. However, to me, this is just another handout to them, and I don't think they really get as much out of it, so I did it just a little bit different. I put those onto cards like this, and all I do is put these in a stack. They have to draw two or three of them, take back to their group, read them, and try to figure out what the problem is. Once they're done, we usually come back as a group and discuss these. Makes for good discussion, and other people can throw in their, their take on some of the different ones. Since we're gonna be in this unit using eggs, one of the first things I would do is go over the egg safety with them, because you want them to be aware of bacteria and how to handle eggs, and washing their hands before and after when using eggs as well. So I mainly just go over this with them. But since we are gonna be in the kitchen, if we do the deviled egg recipe, this is also a good handout to give them. It is the stovetop safety, things they need to know working in the kitchen with the stovetop. Once again, they can keep it in their folder. That way, they have it anytime we are using it. Next, we're up to two recipes. We have two choices here. We have deviled eggs, we have deviled eggs and ricotta roll-ups, both great recipes. You'll find in this curriculum, what they have done is, one of them, you have to have a kitchen, which is the deviled eggs in this case, and one, you do not. That is the ricotta roll-ups. So it kind of depends on your location, what you can do. But no matter what, I still go over the recipe with them because they may want to try it at home. So for the first one, the deviled eggs, I would go over the directions, the recipes, any substitutions that we might have to make. In their house, they may not have the light mayonnaise, so we might talk about can you use regular mayonnaise, so on. So this recipe is a good one, just without a kitchen, I can't do the deviled eggs very easily. However, the ricotta roll-ups is one I do not need a kitchen for. So we would go over the directions, what we need, get everything ready. Sometimes the first lesson, I may go ahead and make the first one just to show them, but after that, I'm all about them doing it themselves, having them do it. Now that doesn't mean that you can't help out if someone needs it, but pretty much I let them kind of be in charge of that. Now, at the end of every lesson, there's an extra little bonus part that's an alternative. It's called Pick It Up. You'll find this in the back of each lesson. If you do not have kitchen space, or you do not have, or you're doing a lesson outdoors, whatever the situation might be, this is a great alternative. It's a little more physical activity, making sure that they drink water, and it's always got a recipe included as well. Physical activity, we have a black box that has different activities in it. You would want to find the letter C, which is the group we're working with, which means the activities are more directed towards their age. And you want to choose one that's a warm up, one that's an aerobic, and one that is a cool down. So you would pick three different ones and let them be able to do the physical activity part. But they still get to do some cooking because there's a recipe involved. In this case, it's the ricotta roll-up, which is a really easy one to make. And believe it or not, at this age, a lot of kids have never had ricotta. So it's a little bit different. They think I'm saying cottage cheese and I'm just not pronouncing it correctly. So it's a good one to discuss also. So make sure whichever one, or even if you have time, you can do both. Just have a lot of fun with the lesson as well. Thank you. Welcome to Lesson 2C, Eating the Five Food Groups. The objectives of this lesson are for students to be able to understand why we need to eat food from all five food groups, recognize the importance of eating breakfast, and prepare a quick and healthy breakfast recipe. Hi. This lesson is the five food groups, which is a great one to have to talk with this age. They should at this point have probably identified the My Plate. The My Plate has five different food groups on it with five different colors. A lot of times, I, if I have the poster with me, I'll turn it around the other way and see if they can identify which color goes with which group. You'll be surprised that even just with the media and what they've seen, they'll be able to identify which color goes to which group. We then discuss some of their favorite foods. If time allows, I let them all tell me what their favorite food is. Then we discuss why, even though some of their foods are extremely healthy, why you can't just rely on one food. And we discuss the importance of all five food groups. 
To get all the nutrients you need, you have to have all five food groups. So it's kind of a discussion point on which foods go into which food groups and why we need all five. It all comes down to needing all the different nutrients. Then we're able to play a game, which kind of, kind of helps um, identify those five food groups. The game is the food group bingo sheet that looks like this. What I do is have them each have a handout. They fill in five different grains, five vegetables, five fruits, five dairy, and five protein. Um, a lot of times I encourage them to think of something a little bit different or one or two that's a little bit unusual so that the game can last a little longer. What I do is I either have a chalkboard, a whiteboard, or even just a piece of paper if there's nothing else in the room. Um, I will point to them and ask them to, to name a grain or a fruit. I do not let them pick. That way they can't just try to get bingo immediately. I identify one group. They have to give me one from that group. Once they get five down, five across, or five diagonally, they say bingo. We check to make sure they win the game. So it's just kind of a fun way to reinforce the five food groups. We talk about that you need all five food groups for all three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So since we're going to be doing a recipe that involves breakfast, something for them to eat for breakfast, we have to use a microwave. So in this instant, I would also get out the microwave safety handout. We would talk about it, discuss it, go over it all, but also this handout would be theirs to keep as well. And the recipes that they brought this time that we have are called breakfast bars and granola sundaes. I'll first kind of talk about the granola sundaes just for a minute. This is a real easy one to make. In a classroom, you do not have to have a kitchen. It basically requires granola, yogurt, and then fruit on top, or nuts as well. Sometimes instead of using granola, I'll substitute like Cheerios. It's a whole grain, still healthy. A lot of my kids are not familiar and their house doesn't have granola in it. It'll have different types of cereal. So we discuss substitutions you can make when you're making this at home as well. But it's a great activity that you do not need a kitchen for. The one that you do need the kitchen for is the breakfast bars because you gotta have a microwave. You're also gonna need some other supplies as well. You're gonna need a bowl to mix it all up with. You're going to need measuring spoons to measure and measuring cups as well, a spoon, and even a knife. And you're thinking, why a knife? Well, even though we've not done the measurement yet, we will discuss just a little bit today about measuring off that you want to make it even so you have to come across it to make sure that it's even. If you just fill it up and dump it in, your measurements are not going to be accurate. They will, the next lesson, get to do a lot more hands-on with this, but I do like to go ahead and cover it just a little bit on this lesson so that they realize how to measure as well. When we're talking about the recipe and we get to uh, the microwave safety, I just want to remind you also that you want to point out to them that certain containers do not go in a microwave. So make sure that they use the proper glass container, if it's the breakfast bars, whatever it might be. Just reinforce that, make sure they understand that as well. Well, that's it for the five food groups. Hope you enjoyed it and don't forget to kick it up. Hello and welcome back. The objectives for Lesson 3C, Choose Whole Grains, are for students to be able to identify the grain group as a good source of fiber, vitamins, and minerals, compare the food labels of foods containing whole grains and refined grains, measure ingredients correctly, use safe cooking techniques with a conventional oven and toaster oven, and prepare a healthy recipe using whole grains. Hi, this is Lesson 3. This is about grains. We've already talked about the five food groups last time, so now we're kind of breaking it all down. So we talk about grains. What are the different grains? Um, at this age, they can usually identify for sure wheat, but we want to go into more detail. Corn, oats, rice. Um, this lesson also talks about where we get some of our grains. Um, here in Missouri, we produce several grains, but it also talks about other countries and where those grains, what grains we get from there. So because of that, I also always bring that up. This age group seems to be interested in that. Different facts is also very important, just where the grains come from. Then we go into the different grains being whole grains. 
what is a whole grain? We talk about the whole grains being using the whole seed. When we talk about wheat, of course I show them wheat, and we point out that the seeds in the top are the part that we're talking about. A lot of times they identify white flour, but they do not identify the brown flour or the whole grain flour. They want to know why we need those. Well, the whole grains give us more nutrients. When the white flour is made from the, the wheat seed, the fiber is taken out because the outer shell part of the seed is also removed. So we talk about half their grains should be whole. How do they identify what a whole grain is? Well, I tell them reading labels is about the easiest way to go. So if you can bring foods, and it doesn't even matter what grain foods you bring in, but when you're using real labels, they're able to identify with it more. Choose any. If you happen to have some that you're using for other classes, you can use those too. These happen to be things I just happen to have that I use with other classes, so I use these labels. Letting them divide up in groups and actually read the label. We want them to be able to identify that they're looking for that first ingredient. That first ingredient is going to tell them a lot of whether it's a whole grain. I explain to them, I too get tricked sometimes, thinking something is a whole grain when it's not. What they have done is just added a little whole grain to it. So make sure that you explain to them that there is a difference from some whole grain being added and whole grain. Basically, you're just dividing them up, letting them go through, see which ones are whole grains. Then discuss with them whatever labels you might have. And you can also use the label cards if you do not have the food items, too, that also works. Um, usually for this age, too, I throw in the fact that you can't go by color alone. Just because the bread's brown does not mean it's whole grain. You still have to check the label. So when it comes to the cooking part, we have a handout. It's called Measure It Right. All I did was take this handout and made it put a little color on it because I use this a lot with having them leaving it up so they can identify the different cups and measurements. But I also will give them a plain copy of this to put in their folder as well. So at this point, I usually divide them into stations. We'll have a station where we'll have measuring cups like this and we use these for the dry ingredients, and we talk about that. That's your flour, your sugar, so on in that order. Then we have the measuring spoons. This is where we get into the teaspoons, the tablespoons, half a teaspoon, a third of a teaspoon, so on. So this one is pretty important on measuring because is there a difference between one tablespoon of salt and a half a teaspoon of salt? they'll learn there's quite a bit of difference there. So this one's a pretty important one too. And I tell them that a lot of this is used for baking soda, baking powder, salt, those items, your smaller ingredients. And then a lot of times they wanna know why I have this measuring cup because they have those measuring cups and that seems like a waste to them that we would have different measuring cups. And I explain that this one is for liquids. So if we're measuring water or we're measuring milk, this would be the one we would use. Now, we do go over some little tricks of the trade with this too. If I'm measuring something in this and I'm looking and I find the one cup, and after I find the one cup, I pour my milk into it, but I'm looking from this angle down, is it the same? Well, then we have to explain to them they have to get down eye level to it to be able to tell if it's actually at one cup. When you look above something, it's gonna look different. So the measuring of the one cup. When going back to the measuring spoons and cups, we also discuss making sure you level it off. So let's say I have a fourth of a cup. If I dip it in the flour and it comes out, it's probably gonna be rounded over with flour. That's not one fourth a cup. So you wanna always make sure you level it off, just like that. So I put these in stations. There'll be a station with the measuring cups, a station with the measuring spoons, and a station with this. Usually I'll have bowls there for them to be able to measure from it. When they do that, they're able then, and I will usually give them something to measure, like they have to measure half a cup of water and two-thirds a cup. At this age, they should be able to start identifying more than just a half a cup or a cup. They should be able to start doing the three-fourths, two-thirds, some of the different measurements that they may use. So I will usually have written down or have a paper that has or a card that has what measurements they have to do at that table. Sometimes it's half a teaspoon or a quarter of a teaspoon just so they start getting aware of the new and different measurements that they're going to see in recipes. Now today's recipes 
you're going to hear another word that they may not have heard, and that is a thermometer. So because they use the thermometer to check, because we are going to be making uh, pretzels, they have to use yeast, which needs warm water. It might be a good time to start thinking about using a thermometer with them. You, the thermometer, you're wanting it to read with the water, 105 to 115. Um, you want it warm, but not boiling, not hot. So it's just kind of a fun way to get started. They might be able to check the water temperature for the recipe. The two recipes today that they're going to be doing is pretzel shapes and banana wraps. And like I said before, one you have to have a kitchen, one you do not. The one that you do not have to have the kitchen is the banana wraps. Now, the thing with the banana wraps that you want to be aware of, and even with the pretzels, is food allergies. On that first lesson, or even when you scheduled your programs, you need to make sure that you have an allergy sheet filled out. There are several gluten allergies now, or there's peanut butter allergies. You want to make sure that you're choosing a recipe that doesn't have anyone that has those allergies. So just make sure you get your allergy sheet first. Obviously, if somebody has a peanut butter allergy, I probably would not want to do the, the banana wraps. Banana wraps are easy. Make sure, though, since we're talking whole grains, that you use the whole grain tortilla wrap. Basically, you're going to do that, put the peanut butter down, and put the banana on it. It's a real easy one, so it's one that they can actually do themselves. Sometimes, though, to work on the measurements sometimes, I will say they have to use one tablespoon of peanut butter, just so they have to do the measurement with it and kind of tie the lesson in with the, with the recipe as well. Today, the one that we're talking about, though, is the pretzel shapes. Pretzel shapes requires quite a few different things. So we'll be using the measuring cups, the teaspoon, two different bowls, the spoon. You will also need a baking pan as well. Sometimes at this point, they kind of get a little relaxed. You might have to remind them about cleanup too, that that's just as an important part, making sure that they get it cleaned up as well. So at this point, I usually will help them, but I like to pretty much let them at this point with this age, do the measuring themselves, mix it up, make the pretzels themselves. Well, that's it for the whole grains. Don't forget, though, you can always kick it up. Hello again. This is Lesson 4C, I'll Eat These Veggies. The objectives of this lesson are for students to be able to identify the vegetable group as a good source of fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Recognize vegetables are high in vitamin A. Use techniques to preserve nutrients in vegetables. Prepare a healthy recipe using vegetables. Wash vegetables correctly and use safe cooking techniques. Let's begin. Hi, this is the veggie lesson. Um, they've already talked about the five food groups in one of the previous lessons, so they should be able to identify this with the green on the My Plate. Um, we talk about why vegetables are so important for is the nutrients that we need. When it comes to vegetables, the highlighted one that we talk about is also vitamin A. However, they also know that it's vitamins, minerals, fiber is also found in, in vegetables as well. Riddle is just is a worksheet for them to be able to do. It's more for fun, but it also starts getting them to think about vegetables as well. They're probably not going to know all of these, and that's okay because it's kind of a communications afterwards to discuss with them. You can either do this as a group activity or have them work with partners individually to do it or have them work on their own. It's just whatever your group, how you see your group doing this one. Um, I have done this before and we divided up in groups to see who could get the most right. Went back and then we discussed all the answers. And it was kind of amazing because even a couple of the vegetables I didn't think about, they had thought of. So you kind of get, a, get their, their mind thinking as well. So this is a good one to start with and that way they already have in their head some different vegetables to think about. Um, this can also be kept then in their, in their uh, notebook as well or in their folder. After that, we then go into the different colored vegetables. A lot of times I have them point out what colored vegetables are, which ones are green, which ones are orange. You can see from the table, they come in a lot of colors, orange, green, yellow. And I even go into more depth when it comes to green, that there's light green, dark green, and does that matter? After we discuss the different colors and why we need to eat different colored vegetables, we have the food model cards like this that you will have. And on the back of these, 
it has the nutrients on them. What I do is divide them up, have them come up, pick a few, I may hand them out, whichever way is easier for you. I then have them compare because vitamin A is listed on there. So they find vitamin A and find out how much it has. We're shooting for 100% for the day and usually they're amazed. There's some that has way more vitamin A than they anticipate and some that are, does not have as much that they thought would have more. They're able to kind of identify which ones have more vitamin A. When it comes to this, we identify some new things that we're gonna use. Most of them, identify that this looks like a brush, which it is. And then we discuss what we could use it for. Um, a lot of them have never used a vegetable brush. They say they just use their hands, whatever, to wash the vegetables off. They have a pillar, which some of them are, can identify the food pillar and some can't. But this gives them an idea of what they're gonna be using. Knives, and we do talk about knives and how we have to be careful with them. We do have a segment later that's gonna be talking more about knife safety. We talk about cutting boards and with fruits and vegetables, making sure that you keep your, food, your cutting boards clean when you're done. You don't wanna cross contaminate. Cutting a chicken up and cutting your vegetables up on the same cutting board without cleaning them, not a good idea. So we talk about the cross contamination when it comes to cutting boards and the grater as well. So we're getting to the recipes. Like I said, there's always two. Taco Bowl is the one that you're not gonna need a kitchen for. Um, Taco Bowl has everything that you can prepare without a stove, without an oven. Um, so it's a good one in a classroom where you do not have a kitchen. It does have the vegetables, so they're still gonna get to chop, they're still gonna get to peel and use the vegetables to make it, but they're not gonna have to use it for using in the kitchen. Good one to use. Next though, the baked potato with cheesy vegetables, it's one that you pretty much have to have a kitchen of some sort. First, you're gonna do the baked potatoes, which means they're gonna use a scrub brush to clean the potatoes. If you do not have an oven, but have electric skillet or some other appliance that you can use to heat, um, cheese up and the vegetables up, you can use that. I have on occasion went ahead and done the baked potatoes ahead of time, and that way they just had to do the vegetable mix that goes on top of the baked potato. The vegetable mix is pretty much your cheese, your broccoli, and you can choose lots of different vegetables, and we discuss in this recipe what they call for and how you can throw in other vegetables as well to go on top of your baked potato. So it kind of depends on your kitchen how you're gonna be able to make this work. Sometimes you can do the potatoes right there if you have a microwave, sometimes you can't. There's just no way of doing the potatoes there. So I have done them ahead of time before um, and then showed them exactly like we'll still scrub a potato, still wrap it up, but we just don't have the oven to put it in and then miraculously I pull out all these baked potatoes so they can still do it. And I've used the electric skillet to do the cheese and the vegetables to put on top. So you can sometimes make it work without the kitchen. This, these, this recipe is just a little bit harder and you might have to think it out ahead of time. Um, having them grate and do the pillar is a good idea. They're old enough and they want to be able to participate. Making sure that they wash their hands to start with is always one thing I remind them of, even though we've talked about it with every lesson. We talk about keeping your hands and your germs to yourself versus spreading germs around. So this is it for the veggie lesson. Don't forget though to kick it up. Hello and welcome back. The objectives for Lesson 5C, Fantastic Fruits, are for students to be able to identify the fruit group as a good source of fiber, vitamins, and minerals, prepare a healthy recipe using fruit, explain how to prevent browning of cut fruit, explain how to select fruit, explain how to wash and store fruit correctly. Let's get started. Okay, this is the fruit lesson. Before I get started on the fruit lesson, I thought I would go over some details that you might want to remember. Um, before I start each lesson besides lesson one, one of the things I do is review the past lesson. So our last lesson was a vegetable lesson, so this would be the time that I would review and go over with them the lesson. Now one of the things you might want to make sure you look at is in the curriculum, the front page, if you turn around to the back page, they have review for each lesson. Now you can use these the next lesson to review what you've just talked about today, or you can actually at the end of each lesson, 
review so that you make sure you hit all the highlights of what that lesson is. Sometimes I'll do it at the end as we're wrapping up after they've cleaned up. Just kind of depends on the class and the day. But don't forget that you do have those review questions as well. Um, today we're talking about the fruit group. Now this is one that I want to stress to them about fiber, vitamins, minerals, and especially vitamin C. A lot of times in this lesson, I want to point out to them all the different fruits that we do eat and all the different colored fruits that we eat as well. So a lot of times I'll just kind of have these out or if you have the regular fruit, that's great too. But these cards are great just to refer to when it comes to fruit. I like for them to be able to participate by telling me one of the most common fruits that they eat and then a lot of times I'll have them tell me a fruit that's unusual that they might have tried and tell us what it tasted like, how it was, how it was prepared. Um, recently I was able to try dragon fruit, so that was one that I told the kids about the other day. They loved hearing about it, they loved the color of it, the texture, you know, me just talking about how different it was. So sometimes just letting them participate. This age group loves to participate, they want to get involved, so the more that you can have them interacting, the better lesson will be. I do point out with this lesson, fresh fruit is a great option. However, it does spoil fast. How do we keep it from spoiling as fast? A lot of times we talk about storing it in the refrigerator, making sure. Um, another thing is handling the fruit. In the last lesson, I brought out the vegetable brush to make sure that they clean the vegetables off well. And you also want to point out that we do not use the brush for every fruit. Um, I did have a class one time, and once again, my mistake, I assumed they would know not to use the brush on a pear. When I turned around, I have never seen a mangled pear so much. There was no skin left on the pear because she had scrubbed it really well. So don't assume. You might need to discuss with them what foods that you would use the brush on. A lot of your soft fruit, we just want to rinse. We do not want to scrub. I also point out to them anything knife is going to go through. Even though we're not eating the outside, we want to make sure we also rinse those things off too. When I fix fresh pineapple, for example, in a class, I still rinse it off because my knife is going to go through there as well. So you mainly just want to talk to them about that. Um, fruit turning brown, they always want to talk about that, how we can stop that or why it, why it does that. And I talk to them about lemon juice um, and um, pineapple juice and how you can put that on those to keep them from turning brown. So make sure you cover those activities. In this particular lesson, <laughs> It talks, you're going to find this unusual, it talks about a bird. Um, because in this lesson, kiwi was actually named after a bird. Um, the bird is a brown, fuzzy bird, and it had the name kiwi first. Then they named the fruit because they identified a lot with the bird, kiwi. Kids find that interesting. Another activity that you might do with them is the bingo kitchen abbreviation game as well. Now you've already been talking and you already did the measurement with them, so they should be learning what TSP stands for, teaspoon, OZ, ounce, but this is just a fun game to re reinforce it. It's just a bingo game, so it makes it really easy. Now before we go into the kitchen, which we're going to do with some recipes, good time to remind them and go over knife safety with them. Knives are going to be used in this lesson, and I tell them that knives are responsibility. So when it comes to the knives, we go over almost every lesson how to handle the knife, how to clean the knife. So make sure that you go over that with them as well. I know that they probably might even get tired of hearing it by the last lesson, but it's okay to review it because you sure wouldn't want to forget it and one of the child not remember it. So just go over knife safety and what knives you're going to do. Using words like chopping and dicing kind of helps them get used to that too. So when you're using the knife, just keep that in mind. Today we'll also be using the cutting board. So I also always go over the cutting board, making sure it's clean. You do not want them to use a cutting board that's not and cross-contaminate. By the end of my seven lesson, they all have that cross-contamination word down because I use it a lot when it comes to the cutting board. In this recipes that we're going to do today, you would need a bowl. You could use it measuring spoons, cups, spoons, spatula. So you'll need to have those things on hands. The one without the kitchen is the nutty grapes. Simple recipe. One of the things you can do with the grapes is freeze them if you can ahead of time. Um, it gives it a little different texture, a little bit different taste. 
And also, if you're going to have a lesson that you don't have use of a freezer, that's okay because by the time they're, you get ready to eat them, they might be a little unthawed, but they're still going to be in good shape. Just keep them in a cooler. Um, nuts, just remember, look at your allergy sheet. Make sure you do not have any allergies before using this recipe. This recipe, you can pretty much put any kind of nut with it with the fruit. And once again, I tell the kids, what other fruits can you use? Make sure they don't think they can't vary from this recipe. They can use many different types of fruits and nuts. A lot of times it might be what they have in their house. So I try to explain to them, fruit's expensive. And if they already have a fruit in their house, they might want to use it instead. It works as well. All of us have different amount of times that we're in a classroom or in a lesson. So this is a good quick recipe to make it work. The other recipe that goes with this one is the fruit salsa with cinnamon chips. Great recipe and it's a great one for them to use the knife. But they get to also use some of the other things that we have worked on. Most of the time for this age, you just really need to review with them. They're going to be able to go over it. And even with this recipe, if you have a different fruit, you can also use it as well. Well, that's about it for this lesson. And don't forget to kick it up. Hello, let's continue with lesson 6C, Go Lean with Protein. The objectives for this lesson are for students to be able to identify a variety of foods in the protein foods group, identify the protein foods group as a good source of protein, B vitamins, and iron, identify healthy ways to cook meat, fish, poultry, explain how to use a meat thermometer correctly, prepare a healthy recipe using chicken. Go lean with protein. This is lesson six. Don't forget at this time, this is where you'd want to review with them the past lesson. In this case, it would be the fruit lesson. Um, you can use the review questions or just ask them questions. It doesn't really matter which way you go. Um, this lesson is the protein group. So we talk about the nutrients in the protein group. Um, this one has different nutrients than the other food groups. And you want to point out B vitamins, iron, protein, these are all found in this group. Um, a lot of times this is where I get the question about meat. Well, isn't this the meat group? Well, it used to be called the meat group, and I tell them that. And the same foods that were in the meat group are in the protein group. We talk about the good things in the protein group with those nutrients, but then we talk about also how there's some of the things in this group not as good, like the saturated fat or the cholesterol. We talk about how some foods in this group are low in fat, like your beans are a good source, or even some of the foods that they might eat on a regular basis, like chicken. But we also talk about how do you make these things even lower. So the cooking method plays a major role. I use words like grilled, baked, deep fried, fried, just so they can learn which words might be lower in fat words, which words might mean higher in fat. Most of them realize if they hear deep fried, gonna be higher in fat. If they hear the word grilled, lower in fat. This particular lesson, uh, safety tips are a great idea. Don't forget to go over your cutting board, your knives, because we are gonna prepare a lesson later that's gonna have chicken, that cross-contamination. I know I'm using the word again. You will use it almost every lesson. Chicken especially is one that you're gonna to wanna to make sure you bring that up with. You don't wanna cut the vegetables up on the same cutting board as you are the chicken. Keeping in mind these things, there is a poster that talks about keeping the food safe. Cooking methods and how you know when something is done. The color when something's done is not what you want to base it off. You want to base it off the thermometer, temperature. You will go over this with them and what temperatures they want to use. For example, there is a handout that says temperature rules. So it gives them an idea of what temperatures different meats should be cooked at to be safe to eat. This one's a very important handout to give them. I find that actually even parents love getting this one because they can be confused about what temperatures different meats have to be cooked at. So make sure this handout goes out to them. It's a great resource for them in the future as well. Now, getting on to the kitchen. This is where they're gonna have a couple recipes. Once again, there's two recipes. The first one, the tortilla twist, does not require a kitchen. So it's a great one if you're not gonna have a kitchen source, an oven source. Um, the next recipe, chicken fingers, that you wanna make sure that you have a kitchen. 
An oven is definitely the best way to go. However, the toaster oven is a great source to teach them a few things like preheating the oven, which you can do on this, the timer, which is also a very good source. But for this recipe, an oven is really needed. Um, so keep that in mind if you're choosing this recipe. Also, you pretty much need a kitchen. You do not want to do this just using desk in a classroom. You want to make sure everything is kept safe, especially when you're dealing with chicken. So keep that in mind with the recipe. With this recipe, they are going to be using the knife to cut the chicken. They're also going to be using um, measuring cups, measuring spoons. One that's a little bit different for this one is they're going to be using the liquid one because they're going to be measuring milk out. We haven't really done that a lot in the recipes up until now, so you might want to go over the difference with them, why we use this one for liquid versus this for our powder ingredients. This is a fun recipe. It is a little more complicated. You will have to probably help them a little bit, especially when it's handling of the chicken. I always tell them there's no magic number when it comes to how many times you wash your hands in the kitchen, but when you're dealing with fresh meat like chicken, you're going to wash your hands several times. Can't help it, and it's a good, good practice to get into. So that pretty much wraps it up for the protein group, and don't forget to kick it up. Hello, the objectives for Lesson 7C, Got Milk, are for students to be able to identify the dairy group as a good source of calcium, identify signs of spoilage in milk and other dairy foods, explain how to use the sell-by date on dairy foods, practice multiplying and dividing recipes, prepare a healthy recipe using cheese. Lesson 7, this is dairy, got milk which is a great lesson. It's actually one of my favorite lessons because I promote milk with all my kids in all my classes no matter what. Calcium is the one nutrient you really want to emphasize on this one. You can still go back, review all the other nutrients that you've talked about up to now. And I also just kind of let them know that calcium is a mineral because they're going to hear the words mineral a lot when talking about nutrients. Now in this lesson, you're going to let them start figuring out some of the other things about the calcium group. They realize that milk's in this group and cheese, but you want them to figure out how much calcium. This is where label reading comes in. You can have the Dairy Council cards and use them, or you can actually have the labels right off of things that they have in the dairy group, like milk or cottage cheese or cheese, anything that you might have. It doesn't have to be specific to anyone. You're just basically wanting them to start reading the labels that are on them to know how much calcium is in each item. They're going to find out that the calcium in milk does not change. But what they will find out reading the label that the difference isn't the calcium, it's the fat. And we've talked about fat in a previous lesson, so this kind of lets them know which ones are lower in fat because we've talked about that less fat might be the better way to go on some items. So just reading the labels is one of the main activities and promoting three cups every day of milk. You also want to go into safety with them again. More of a reminder, um, just go over the cutting board. But with safety, we've got a new item, the griddle that they may not have used yet. I want them to realize that it's hot across the whole surface, so they do not want to use their hand to touch. If they have to get close, they're going to use a pot holder or a glove to be able to touch it. I also would tell them to turn anything, you're going to use the turner or also known as the spatula a lot of times. You may have to explain the cleanup on this one also. We're not just going to dump this into the sink of water. So the cleanup is going to be a little different and you may have to go over that as well with them. So reading the labels and kind of all this goes with the calcium group. Um, there is a worksheet that's called What Would You Do Situations. These are kind of fun to divide the groups into two groups or three groups, however many you want, to discuss the situation and decide what they're going to do. You can use it worksheet form like this. All I did was divide them up and just put them on cards and made them a little more colorful so when they take them to their table or to their lesson area, just made it a little more like a game activity. Either way works, so whichever way you want to do it. There is an activity that's in here about how much should I make. It has single recipes, double recipes, cutting the recipe in half. So this one involves math. It, they're going to have to do some figuring out to see how it works. I do find letting them work in groups works the best, or at least with a partner. You don't want to individualize them too much in this area with this one. Um, sometimes then we will actually go over it to see if they got it right 
and what would happen if they didn't. If they didn't cut it, what would it do to the recipe? We discuss these things. So you may have to help them out a little bit. It's pretty easy, one cup, cut it in half, it's a half a cup, those they get. Some of the others involving three-fourths, two-thirds, you may have to work with them on this sheet as well. But it kind of gives them an idea how they can double a recipe or cut it in half, either way. Today's recipes that they're gonna make is the banana pudding. Real simple one. They're gonna be using banana, milk, they're gonna be making their own banana pudding. Most of them will say to me, why can't I just buy banana pudding? Well, you can, but you can also make it with vanilla pudding by adding bananas in it, which then again puts those extra nutrients. So it's a great recipe. You do not have to have a kitchen for this one, so it works really good, especially in a classroom size setting or outdoors. Either way works great. The other recipe is the pizza wraps, but I will tell you, these are popular. They do like making these. Just have to remember that with these, once again, they're very good with, with learning about using the equipment. Cheese is involved in this one and they realize that that's where they get their calcium from. So the pizza wraps is a great recipe. They're not gonna need a lot of help with it, but just remember the safety. I always go over safety with them and hand washing. Well, I think that about sums it up for the dairy group and don't forget to kick it up. Welcome back to the final lesson of Level C. The objectives for Lesson 8C, Meals with Appeal, are for students to be able to identify guidelines for planning healthy meals, prepare a healthy meal together, and celebrate their accomplishment of completing Kids in the Kitchen. You're in Lesson 8, Meals with Appeal. This is the kind of the wrap-up of everything you've taught them, putting the hand washing, the food safety, the knife safety, all together putting all five of those food groups together to make a meal. Before you get started on that, there's one more last activity, ways in which to cut calories. And that is a recipe for brownies called Can I Still Have Chocolate? I don't lie to them. Yes, I like chocolate too. So, ways in which you can cut calories so that you can make it work. Now, with this, you may have to help them. There's some things they can't cut. One of the things you might want to refer them back to if you have given them one of these folders is, that on the inside of this folder, right over here on this side, it gives them some suggestions, ways in which to cut calories, things they can use instead of what might actually be in the recipe. Some things they can't cut, and you'll have to go over that with them too. So it's kind of a fun activity for them to do to see what they can change things out with. After that, you kind of want to just talk about the five food groups. Half your plate being fruits and vegetables. So you want to make sure that they realize that. One of the things we're talking about is also the peel of the plate. If everything on the plate's brown, not looking very appetizing. Texture, taste, smells, all go into planning that meal. There is a sheet that you'll have that says, meals that make your mouth water. This is a good one to go over with them because it talks about everything I just said, colors, texture, so that they kind of get an idea of just exactly what goes in to planning a meal that they'd really want to eat. Now. This comes down to the recipes. This, this lesson is more about celebrating everything they have learned. So there are several recipes that you can use with this one. Ha and you may actually want to bring these recipes out on lesson seven and let them choose. But if not, that's okay too, when you can choose a couple that go along with it. The recipes are surprise salad, which is a good one to use. Tacos, that once again, include a lot of food groups. Fruit pizza, I will tell you, happens to be a very popular one. Also another one, easy cheesy tortilla bake. The two that they chose in here to use to kind of give you an example is the lasagna roll-ups, easy one to make, using several food groups as well, and the tossed green salad. The tossed green salad is something that can be prepared without a lot of space, so it's a good one too. The lasagna, once again, you're going to need a kitchen for it to make this one work. Um, these are good ones because you're able to see all the food groups this way. Once they prepare and get it all ready, this is a good time to have them set down, set the table, make it more of a meal plan. Explain to them they can use these same things when planning snacks as well, color, texture. But for this lesson, you're more talking about making it a full meal, and you're more talking about having it as a celebration. So it's a good time to set the table. Have them work on those skills as well. While you're sitting there and you're eating, 
Conversation is a great thing, letting them know that this can be sometimes when you're setting with your family, a time for conversation as well. One of the things that you want to make sure you don't forget is their certificate of honor because this is a certificate that allows them to know they completed the kids in the kitchen. And that's kind of important for them that they know the knife safety, they know um, the utensils to use, the measuring cups. They learned a lot about math and science with this curriculum as well, learning to do those things. So make sure at the end that you're able to do the certificate with them. Believe it or not, they take a lot of pride in it and that's what we want them to do. I hope you enjoy this because I can tell you from experience the kids will love it too. Thank you. Thank you.